pleasure to introduce our first uh, keynote speaker, Professor Julius Friedrichsen. Um, Julius uh, was awarded his PhD from the University of Arizona in 2001, and it's quite extraordinary what he has achieved since then. Um, he's a speech-language pathologist, founder and director of the Aphasia Lab at the University of South Carolina, and director of the Center for the Study of Aphasia Recovery, and also co-director of the McLaughlin, apologies for my pronunciation, Center for Brain Imaging at the University of South Carolina. Um, Julius has been doing some amazing work trying to better understand aphasia recovery and its underlying mechanisms with the overall goal of getting better outcomes for patients. So understanding how treatments work, how recovery works, and then being able to provide us with clinical tools that we'll be able to use and implement in aphasia treatment and care. Um, so, and a little known fact, he used to be in a rock band. <laughs> I just had to say that. There's quite a few failed rock musicians amongst us. Um, not to say that he failed, he might have just chosen to do this other profession. So, um, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Um, thank you, David, and thank you very much to the organizing committee for uh, inviting me. This is my first trip to Australia. It's been delightful so far. My wife and I got here on Sunday, and uh, we, we've been staying up in Noosa since, uh, since then. It's been, it's been pretty rough, though, you know, deciding which fabulous restaurant to go to or how long to nap at the beach. But it's been wonderful, so uh, thank you. But, um, I'm going to be talking about a recent clinical trial that we completed in my lab at the University of South Carolina and also at the Medical University of South Carolina. And we were looking at the effects of transcranial direct current stimulation or electrical uh, brain stimulation to improve aphasia treatment outcome. This is a trial that we published this year um, and we're, follow we're, we're planning a follow-up trial and I'll talk about that in a little bit. So here's the outline of what I'm going to discuss. I'm going to start by talking about electrical brain stimulation. What is it? What are the possible mechanisms? Um, previous studies, our trial, uh, overall outcome. And then I'm going to talk about some very interesting results that we, we've been getting with looking at BDNF genotype results with regards to uh, the response to the electrical brain stimulation. So, for those of you who know what TDCS is, uh, I apologize, but I'm going to uh, uh, explain that in a little bit of detail here. So, TDCS, or transcranial direct current stimulation, is a really simple uh, setup. What it does is that it induces an electrical current between two electrodes that you place on the scalp. And both animal studies and human models have shown that it can either uh, excite or have in inhibitory effects on the cortex. So the way that this typically goes is that you put an anode electrode, like in our case, on the left, uh, on the left scalp, targeting the left hemisphere, and a cathode electrode on the opposite side. Um, then you induce a current flow between those two electrodes, and it's usually a really weak current, one to two milliamps. It has been shown that if you go far above that, uh, a lot of times the effects go away. So there seems to be this sort of sweet spot from one to two milliamps. Um, the brain current intensity, uh, we can actually model that today using what is called a finite element modeling. Looking at the density of different tissue types, we can then predict or model where the current is being induced in the brain. And the current is inward under the anode electrode and outward under the cathode electrode. Again, this is very, very weak current. And to demonstrate that, so the, the stimulating device itself runs on a 9 volt battery. So we're talking about something that, um, yeah, the current is very weak. So there's a lot of TDCS work that has been happening in the last 20 years or so. There was a seminal study that was published in the Journal of Physiology in the year 2000 by Walter and Paulus, they are both German researchers, and they showed very nicely that under the anode electrode, 
you get an excitatory uh, effect on the brain, and under the cathode electrode, you get an inhibitory effect. So the number of studies that are being published in the literature is going up exponentially. And just as an example, anormal TDCS has been suggested to boost long-term memory, improve attention, improve working memory, and, hand, and enhance learning of different kinds, uh, motor processing, vocabulary, arithmetic. A lot of these studies have not been replicated, so I think that until we get more replication studies, we should probably take some of these results with a grain of salt. But overall, the results have been promising. There's also a lot of studies on using TDCS in clinical populations. So TDCS has been used in one form or another uh, to treat depression, to treat MS, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, migraine headache, drug abuse, tinnitus, and uh, for our purposes, stroke. So, most of the TDCS studies so far have focused on motor recovery, but also quite a bit of work in looking at aphasia and motor speech disorders. The problem with a lot of these studies though, and which is very typical for our field, is that they tend to be underpowered, low sample size studies. So why would we try to use TDCS to treat aphasia? Um, let's see. So neuroimaging studies suggest that changes in functional activation of the brain support improved language processing. While if TDCS can be used to modulate either ex excite or inhibit brain activation, then therefore, perhaps TDCS can be used to enhance, encourage, boost, change, whatever you want to use there, brain activation, and therefore improve language processing, either during aphasia therapy or in the absence of aphasia therapy. I will say, uh, probably 95% of the studies in aphasia using TDCS that have been published so far use TDCS during aphasia therapy and the studies that didn't uh, do it during aphasia therapy, those were not significant. If you look at the animal literature, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, it seems that TDCS really has no effect in the absence of external st stimulation. So TDCS by itself is not some kind of a, a magic bullet. So a little bit on the um, previous studies. Um, so does anormal TDCS targeting the left hemisphere improve aphasia treatment outcome? There are many studies that have focused on this. Uh, ours were the first two, Baker et al. and Fredrickson, um, and then several other peoples, including Marcus Meinzer, who is, who is here in Australia. But again, most of these studies have relied on fairly small sample sizes. Uh, not all of them have used randomization, which of course is a, a major problem. And what is an equal problem is that not all of them have used blinded outcome testing, which is a major problem. You really need to make sure that the subjects and the clinicians are blinded to the treatment condition when they're scoring the outcome. So I'm going to tell you really quickly about a couple of studies that we did as pilot studies for uh, our larger trial. The first one was published in the journal Stroke back in 2010, and this was really a, it was really just a curiosity. So when TDCS was coming online, we thought perhaps this is something that can help us improve the effect of the aphasia therapy itself. Um, there you see, that's Frank, one of my previous postdocs, and he actually has the TDCS set up uh, on him right there. The electrode here, this is a large electrode over his uh, left scalp, and then the return left electrode, which is the cathode electrode, is actually on his shoulder. We don't use this setup anymore. We put the cathode electrode usually on the orbital frontal area over the eyebrow, but here's the stimulator itself. It looks kind of primitive, but the setup itself is very simple. And this induces a one milliamp current, and then using that finite element modeling that I showed you earlier, we were then able to model where the current would be flowing based on the density of the different tissues that the current would be passing through. So initially, one of my PhD students wanted to take this on as a, a PhD project. And I told her, you know, a PhD student should never take on a treatment study for their dissertation project, right? I did, which was a it, it, it can drag on forever. But anyway, she did, and she did a wonderful job. It's Julie Baker, who was the first author on the paper. 
And we just wanted to know, is there a reasonable effect to motivate further study in aphasia? There were 10 participants with aphasia who were included in this study. All of them had chronic aphasia, um, and they had various aphasia types and severities based on the Western aphasia battery. The treatment itself was very minimal. Um, we used a crossover design where every one of the participants did five days of uh, aphasia treatment, and they, let's say that somebody started with getting anormal TDCS or active TDCS, then they would take a week off, and during that second week, that second week of treatment, they would still get aphasia therapy, but the stimulation itself was sham or placebo. So it's a crossover stu uh, study with active PDCS compared to placebo. Everybody gets, in every session, gets the aphasia therapy. The session length was 20 minutes. The reason why the study, the, the sessions were so short was because at the time we started this, it, TDCS had not been shown to be safe beyond 20 minutes. We now know that you can do it far longer, but that was the reason why we started with these very short treatment sessions. The behavioral treatment itself is very benign. It is not something that I would prescribe to any person with aphasia, but the nice thing about it is that we do, do show that it improves naming in persons with aphasia, and what it allows us to do, because it's computerized, is to control the treatment across the different arms, which I think is absolutely crucial. So this, if you're interested in this, um, the treatment that we used, the treatment task, it was also published in the journal Stroke back in 2009. Uh, the treatment is really simple. The person sits at a desk, they have a computer screen in front of them, and they have these uh, green and red uh, response buttons, and they have on headphones. They'll see a picture on the screen, and then they see the mouth of a speaker, and they hear the speaker say a word, and they have to determine, did the word match the picture that they saw? And we use uh, both phonological, semantic, and also unrelated foils during the treatment. So they did this for 20 minutes, and at the same time, they were either getting anal TDCS, or they were getting sham TDCS. And that was targeting uh, uh, the left hemisphere, so the frontal cortex. And as soon as they respond, they get immediate feedback. So if they responded correctly, they get the happy face. If they responded incorrectly, they get the frowny face. And this goes on for 20 minutes, and we actually ended up doing this for a lot longer in our clinical trial, which I will describe later. But one thing I think is absolutely crucial why this works really well, because at the end of the treatment session, the accuracy of the task appears, uh, uh, the accuracy of the session appears on the screen. So if you work with people with aphasia, you will know that that's very motivating for a lot of people. Everybody wanted to beat their previous score. People get really down, oh, I went down by two percentage points compared to yesterday, but it was, I think that it was maybe just luck, but I think that this was a major motivating component of this treatment task. But again, this is not what I would expect somebody to be doing in clinical care, but it's nice, it's a treatment task, it works on lexical retrieval or lexical processing, and uh, it's nice to use in a clinical trial of this kind where we're not testing the effectiveness of aphasia therapy, we're testing the effectiveness of the brain stimulation rather than the therapy itself. So uh, a little bit about the TDCS. Uh, like I said, this was a double, uh, this was a crossover design. It was double blinded so that the clinicians uh, that scored the outcome, they did not know when the assessment sessions occurred, either before or after each one of the phases and the participants did not know whether they were getting real or placebo TDCS during whatever uh, treatment phase. The outcome measure was naming. Um, I realized that there are certainly some limitations to that, but for this kind of a study, I think it's perfect because naming is fairly easy to, to measure in aphasia compared to other things. Uh, we looked at both trained items. So these were items that were included on the computer task. And also, we looked at generalization, so items that were not included um, in the treatment. The electrode placement, the anode electrode, the one that is, has the excitatory effect, it was placed over the left frontal lobe, and the cathode electrode was placed on the right shoulder. And we used fMRI to target uh, the electrode itself. The, the MRI was mostly important because we wanted to look at where the structural damage was, 
You don't want to put the electrode directly over where you have damaged cortex. That's like sticking an electrode into a glass of water. It dissipates immediately. So we wanted to make sure that we were not placing the electrode directly over damaged tissue. But also, they did a naming task during the fMRI, and we looked for where we had the greatest amount of active activation in the frontal lobe, and that's where the, the electrode was placed, the animal electrode. So here are the results for the trained items. Uh, we did post-testing for each one of the two phases the day after treatment was completed. On that graph I'm going to show you, that's T1, so time one. We also tested them at one week post. So that's going to be T2. Uh, so more treated items across the whole group were named correctly following anodal TDCS compared to sham. Anodal improvement uh, is what you see in the blue bars. The improvement itself is what you see on the y-axis. So the higher you're going here, the more changes you're seeing. These are actual change scores. And this is just immediately after and at time two, which is one week post. We also saw an improvement on the, the generalization. There was a lot more items included in the generalization uh, battery, but it did not reach statistical significance, but it was close. The reason was because the error bars here were pretty big. So this first study, um, we thought that was, it was encouraging. So animal stimulation of the left frontal lobe improves naming, but only in some participants. Treatment response varied widely. Five participants had greater improvement with animal TDCS compared to the sham or placebo. Four were about the same, and one person didn't respond to either condition. So we thought, okay, and I have to say, this was really just a curiosity when we started this project. But now we thought, okay, maybe there's a reason to keep this going. So we did another follow-up study, which I think was a lot better design. Um, that's the one that was published in Stroke in 2011. This one included actually fewer participants, but these participants tended to be a lot more homogeneous than the first sample that we used. All of them had primarily posterior damage, either including parietal or temporal lobe, or both. Uh, we used the same picture word matching task for treatment as before. The outcome was uh, change in reaction time rather than change in correct naming. The reason why we wanted to do that was that these participants were a lot milder with regards to aphasia severity than what we saw in the first study. So what we were looking for here is that not only, not, not only is there uh, the number of items correctly named improving, but rather is their reaction time uh, shortening following uh, treatment. We did five sessions of TDCS uh, for anal TDCS and five sessions for sham, and the electrode placement was fMRI guided. Uh, we did change, we were stimulating the cortex in this second study. There was a lot more evidence coming out in fMRI studies at this time showing that, um, that at least suggested to us that placing the electrode over posterior language regions made more sense than targeting the frontal lobe, and I still believe that that's the right way to do this. We improved the blinding, so not only were the participants and the clinicians scoring the outcomes blinded to the treatment condition, but also the clinicians who administered the treatment. So the clinician uh, herself would put the electrodes on, they would just press a button, and it was encoded in the software on a computer whether the participant was getting anodal or sham TDCS in uh, in which one, in either one of the two phases. So are the, here are the results for the second study. What we are looking for is an actual decrease on this scale right here. So that means improvement with regards to reduction in uh, reaction time. And what we found was that immediately post-treatment, so this is uh, within a couple of days after each one of the treatment phases, there was a greater reduction in reaction time for the anodal group over shim. That was statistically significant. And the post-treatment assessment uh, uh, was a little bit longer than in the first study. It was one week in the first study, but here it was three weeks. And the effect was maintained at three weeks, and that was still statistically significant, comparing the lighter uh, uh, 
on the light, for the lighter group, that's the analytical TBCA group, and the darker gray is the sham group. So TBCS seems to enhance the effect of behavioral aphasia uh, treatment. I would emphasize the word seems because there's a lot of other studies that support this claim. But still, even though many different groups work on this besides us, the evidence, at least at this point, um, was coming from studies that were probably underpowered and had a lot of problems with regards to things like randomization and, and blinding of outcome uh, assessment. So that brings me to our uh, clinical trial that I'm going to focus most of my talk on today. Um, based on those two initial studies that we published, we went on to uh, conduct a randomized controlled trial. The study question here for, was for individuals with chronic post-stroke aphasia undergoing aphasia therapy, does anodal TVCS enhance outcome? Same question as before, but in a much better power study. We used what is called a futility design, I've gotten a lot of questions from people about what exactly a futility design is. Um, we knew that going into this trial, that this was a phase two trial, that this was not supposed to be a definitive trial. Uh, therefore, we were able to use a futil futility design and use far fewer subjects than a superiority uh, design would have to use. Had we gone to a superiority trial, which I don't think was warranted at this time, we probably would have had to at least triple our sample size. But the futility design, this has been used in clinical trials of, for many different conditions. So these are usually preliminary trials. The null hypothesis actually assumes that anodal TDCS has a benefit over the sham. The alternative hypothesis is that there is no difference. This is really reversed to how we do hypothesis testing, right? But what this allows us to do is to say, what we're looking for here is evidence to suggest that we should not be studying anodal TDCSS uh, 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 for treatment of aphasia anymore. That would be the, if we supported the alternative hypothesis. So we also did a superiority analysis, which is what we are used to seeing in our studies. Uh, the main trial, the futility uh, hypothesis, was published in the journal JAMA Neurology earlier this year. But we also wrote a second paper uh, that includes the superiority analysis. If you are interested in reading these papers, I would definitely say go read the second paper from Brain Stimulation because it really, I think it makes it a lot easier to understand uh, the statistical analyses. Um, all participants received aphasia treatment for three weeks, so we tripled the amount of uh, treatment that we had before. They were randomized to get either anodal TDCS or sham. There was no crossover here. You either, just by luck, ended up getting the real stimulation, or you got placebo. Everybody got the same aphasia treatment that we had before, the, the naming, the lexical uh, processing task. We controlled for aphasia type across the two treatment arms. And it was double-blinded, double so the participants did not know what condition they were in, and the clinicians who administered the treatment and scored the outcome measures did not know what condition the, uh, the patient was getting. And this is very important. We actually tested how, whether people could predict or whether they could tell what condition they were in, and I'll get to that more later uh, in a little bit more detail. Here's the study design. It's very simple. Um, we started with a pool of people with aphasia. Um, they were randomized to either get active TDCS or sham TDCS during aphasia therapy. And then we did outcome testing immediately before and immediately after in two sessions at baseline and two sessions at post, looking at improvements in Navy. We had secondary hypotheses that focused on four weeks and six months. So we have data all the way out to six months for most of the participants, almost all. Here's the enrollment. We screened at the beginning 89 participants. Uh, 50 were not eligible. But for the sake of time, the primary analysis, which is the difference and baseline to uh, uh, naming abilities immediately after the treatment phase, that included 34 people uh, in the anode TDCS group and 40 people in the sham group. And that's just by chance that the sham group got to be just a tiny bit bigger. 
the targeted enrollment was 74 based on our um, power analyses, and we achieved that in just over five years. One of the things that I really like about our study is that we relied on um, a clinic, clinical trial support group uh, that was specifically set up for StrokeNet. StrokeNet is the largest clinical trials network in the United States. It's supported by the NIH, the National Institutes of Health. And they have this group of statisticians that set up an online database that allows our speech language pathologists to enter all of their data online and then it populates a database that, that is uh, maintained by this uh, group of statisticians. Also, all of the statistical analyses that I'm going to report to you are done by that group, not by us. We do no data manipulation, we do no data analyses. It all comes from a separate group that manages clinical trials. And I think that this has been, has been very helpful um, for many different reasons. They do this for a living, they're experts in this, and also, it, it completely removes any bias from our hands towards the data. Uh, the participants, uh, the inclusion criteria, uh, single event ischemic stroke in the left hemisphere, this certainly excluded some people uh, greater than six months post-stroke. Having said that, almost everybody was at least one year post-stroke uh, between the ages of 25 and 80. Uh, South Carolina, which is where I live, it has a pretty dubious distinction in that half of all stroke patients in South Carolina are under the age of 60, so we get a lot of young people with strokes. Um, they had to be previously right-handed, uh, aphasia as confirmed by the Western Aphasia Battery, no MRI con uh, contraindications, and they had to be able to achieve at least 65% accuracy on the naming task that I showed you before. We wanted to make sure that going in, the participants understood how the task worked, or at least we were able to teach them how to use it. Exclusion criteria, history of brain surgery, seizures during the previous 12 months, even though there's no evidence that TDCS induces t uh, seizures, but at the time we thought this was a very uh, safe precaution that we needed to take. They could not score the greater than 80% uh, uh, on the Philadelphia naming test, which was one of the primary outcome measures, because we wanted to make sure that there was enough ceiling, I mean, not enough room between the performance and the ceiling effect, so that everybody would have space to improve. And they were excluded if they were unable to overtly name at least five of the 80 items during the pre-treatment fMRI session. We wanted to make sure that we would get reliable fMRI activation at baseline. The TDCS, again, we used 1 million TDCS, uh, used a fairly common device from uh, Forrester Iomed. Uh, the anode electrode was placed on the left scalp over a targeted cortical region. This was, this was over uh, posterior regions, either uh, temporal or parietal lobe. The cathode electrode was placed on the contralateral supraorbital frontal scalp region, so really above the right eyebrow. And this is just a couple of fMRIs for, uh, from some participants showing the greatest activation in the targeted regions. In these cases, the electrode would basically be placed on the scalp over these targeted regions. What we always tried to make sure was that the electrode is fairly large, it's five by five centimeters. We want to make sure that none of the electrodes was actually placed directly over the, the lesion itself, the cavity. Um, all the participants did two fMRI sessions at baseline, and TDCS stimulation was started at the beginning of the behavioral treatment session, but it remained active uh, for only 20 minutes, but the session itself was 45 minutes. And it's been shown in animal studies that the effect of TDCS, when you turn it off, the effect itself doesn't uh, cease immediately. It, it lasts for about an hour and a half after the about 20 minutes of TDCS. So now the treatment session was quite a bit longer than what we had before. Uh, for the sham TDCS, what we do is that we actually induce the current right at the beginning of the sham session. The reason why we do that is because under the electrodes, you actually feel quite a bit of tingling and a little bit of itching. So we turn on the TDCS, 
and then gradually turn it off within 30 seconds. And that enables us to um, come up with a sham or a placebo condition. This is the electro, these are the coordinates for the fMRI for the two different groups. I, if I remember correctly, I think the blue is for the anal TVCS group, and the red is the coordinates for the sham group. So these are just different coordinates based on that fMRI task that you saw before. For the 74 participants in this study, what you will see is that the, the, state, the greatest activation is actually not that, varied. it doesn't vary that much. The average in, in Euclidean space uh, coordinate for both groups was in the posterior superior temporal sulcus. Uh, the outcome factors, the primary endpoint was change in correct naming at one week post-treatment. Uh, we looked at both trained items, those were 80 items that came from the computer task itself, and untrained items, so that was the Philadelphia naming test, so 175 items. Um, we computed the difference between the average of the two pre-treatment sessions and the average of the two post-treatment sessions. And again, the secondary endpoints were at four weeks and six months post-treatment. We used the Philadelphia naming test, if you're not familiar with that, that's Myrna Schwartz's test, used quite extensively in research to look at naming impairment in people with aphasia. And we used their uh, scoring uh, criteria for our outcome. Uh, here's a, cru a, a crucial element, I think, of this trial that I, I think is very important. The clinicians who were speech language pathologists and the participants, they guessed the treatment condition at the end of each week because we wanted to make sure that they were truly blinded to the treatment condition. And I'll show you the results for how well they were able to guess what the treatment condition was in a little bit. So here are the results. Uh, if you look at that paper in JAMA Neurology, um, this is just a graph straight out of that paper. At one week, uh, what we see here is the blue line is for the group that got anal TVCS. On the y-axis is the improvement in correct naming. And then we have the primary outcome right here, four weeks and 24 weeks or, or six months post-treatment right here. So for um, one week post, we got an improvement of almost 14 words in correct naming with the anaerobic TDCS group and just over eight words for the sham group. The difference was 5.7% or 70% increase in, correct, in, the, in the change in correct naming for anaerobic compared to sham. The futility hypothesis um, was, the, was not significant. Now remember, if it would have been significant, we would have determined that annual TVCS, uh, there was no reason to study it any further for the treatment of aphasia. But the superiority analysis, which is what we're more used to, was statistically significant. It was one tail because we expected annual TVCS to have a benefit over sham, and this was adjusted for aphasia severity uh, at baseline. <laughs> At four weeks, uh, the improvement in the animal group was 16.8 words, and the sham group 9.4, an increase in 79% for the in animal compared to sham. Futility hypothesis again was not statistically significant, but the superiority analysis was. And then finally, at six months, uh, the improvement was 14.9 words for the animal group and 7.1 for the sham or more than doubling of the improvement. Futility hypothesis is not significant, but the superiority analysis was. So other relevant data, the treatment, guessing the treatment conditions, uh, what we found was that the participants and the clinicians were basically at chance guessing. So that tells us that People were like, oh, I think, I'm, I, I think I'm getting the real thing. I'm getting the real thing. Oh, yeah, this is going great. But they had no idea, really. And the, clinician, and the, the participants always tended to be more optimistic. Oh, I'm definitely getting it. I'm definitely getting it. And clinicians were like, no, uh -uh. this guy's not getting it. But in both cases, they were wrong. So improvement on the treatment task. Um, all but one participant improved on the treatment task. Uh, so greater task accuracy in the last treatment session become, compared to the first treatment session. The average improvement on the task was about 10 percentage points. So there was a lot of variability in this task. I was surprised that people didn't complain more about the task. It's pretty mundane. 
And I think a lot of it had to do with showing them that accuracy at the end. For some reason, it's very motivating. Um, I want to show you the generalization from the trained to untrained items. Um, this is not published, but what we found was that for the animal group, which is the, the blue, compared to the sham, there was a high correlation between, oh, sorry, between the PNT, which is the generalization items, and the trained items, which is the, the naming, what we call naming 80 here. Also, if you look at the outcome, most of the participants that are doing well were in the uh, anaerobic group. Either, either way that you slice it, certainly a lot of people that don't improve on either, in either condition. But there was a nice transfer from uh, trained to untrained items. At four weeks, uh, again, correlation was, uh, the R squared was 0.32, so accounting for about almost a third of the variance. Uh, and then again, at 24 weeks, uh, the correlation was even higher here. A lot of people did not improve, but certainly for those that do improve, most of them are in the annual group. Another very important part of this study, which is one of the two reasons why we wanted to do it, was to look at adverse events. So what happens to people who get a lot of sessions of TDCS? If we look at the combined number for everybody in the animal group, which was 34, uh, multiplied times the 15 treatment sessions, we were talking about, I think, 600 plus TDCS sessions. And what we basically found was that there were no adverse events. There was one serious adverse event during the study. Uh, a gentleman had a seizure at the, at the night of his sixth treatment. But luckily for us, that person was in the sham group. Given the number of participants that we follow for that period of time, I was surprised we didn't see more seizures over this uh, study period. But so a couple of people uh, had some redness of the skin uh, under the amyl electrode, but there was nothing to be majorly concerned about with regards to adverse events. Now. When we were putting in this grant proposal, there was a paper that had just been published in the journal Neuron. Um, this is a very important paper for those of us who study TDCS, and admit there's a lot of research that has come out of this. What they were looking at was the mechanisms behind TDCS and why it might work. This was a study by Fritz et al. And we submitted the grant, and one of the reviewers, because we had to revise and resubmit, one of the reviewers suggested to us, well, look, there is this animal research coming out suggesting that um, um, normal or typical BDNF gene actually is associated with better outcome with TDCS than an atypical BDNF, so a polymorphism of a BDNF gene. Why don't you look at this in your study? And this was really based on this paper showing that in knockout mice, an atypical BDNF gene was associated with literally no response to TDCS. So, I'm just going to go through this uh, fairly quickly here. So, actually, you know what, this is a long slide, I'm just going to cruise through this. I have a lot more data to show you. So, um, basically what it said was that in these knockout mice, um, abnormal BDNF gene, very limited BDNF secretion. So, BDNF is a protein that is crucial for brain plasticity. If you knock out the BDNF gene, those mice become very abnormal. They're basically stupid mice. But the, what we wanted to see here was that can we predict, can we um, look at interaction between uh, TDCS and BDNF genotype? Every one of our, well, most of our participants, we, in them we collected the two milliliters of whole blood uh, sample. It was sent to a, a, a a company that did all the genotyping for us, they sent their um, results back to the statistical st uh, uh, the statistics group and they did the analysis for us. Uh, we were looking at a polymorphism that is called RS6265 uh, and a typical genotype of this polymorphism or a val val, we see that in about 70% of the population. Uh, for the atypical genotype is present in about 30%. It varies across racial groups, 
replication, which, which was the sample for most of our, which was the case for most of our participants, it's about a 70 to 30 split. So atypical, which is so opposed, supposedly associated with less secretion of BDNF, um, that was the bowel met or the met met polymorphism. This is just a breakdown across the groups. It was fairly uh, similar with regards to who got amyloid PDCS and who got sham, and whether the person had typical or atypical BDNF. It's just the, the, the distribution method. Right here are the results, and what we expected here was that based on BDNF genotype, we should see no difference with regards to outcome in the folks that got the sham TDCS. What if this is really true that we can translate this from animals into uh, humans, we should see a difference within the animal TDCS group, so that the folks with typical BDNF should respond better than folks with atypical BDNF. And we found exactly that. So if you look here at this graph, uh, this is assessment of 1, 4, and 24 weeks. This is actually a proportional improvement on the naming task. If we just look at the, the, the absolute improvement on the task, it pretty much looks exactly the same. But there was a st statistically significant difference between the typical BDNF genotype group and the atypical BDNF genotype group only in the anaerobic TDCS condition. There was no difference within the sham. As a matter of fact, the, the atypical group was doing a little bit better. But this was not close, even close to being statistically significant. In our mixed effects model, what we found was that there was no main effect of genotype. So genotype itself did not influence how well somebody responded to the aphasia treatment itself. But there was a definite interaction between the TDCS and the genotype. And that was statistically significant at 0.03, suggesting that um, those with typical BDNF genotype do better than those with atypical BDNF genotype with regards to response to TDCS. So a little bit on the discussion, uh, anormal TDCS enhances the effect of aphasia therapy, at least for anomia. BDNF genotype predicts response to TDCS, and there were no adverse events associated with anormal TDCS. I think that at this point, because our trial was not a definitive trial, we need to do more research to verify these effects. I think at the very least, we need to uh, replicate these findings. And that's exactly what we're planning to do. We're going to a phase three trial, which is in the plans right now. If TDCS is found to be ready for clinical use, uh, I think there's a lot of questions that we need to answer. Do speech language pathologists then need training uh, to use TDCS? I would think that that's definitely a yes. We need to know a little bit more about where and how to stimulate do we need the MRI for electrode placement? I think that that would be a deterrent for deployment. Uh, and do we need the genetic testing? And we've had a lot of discussions about that already. Should we only take in people in the phase three trial who have the typical BDNF genotype? And I, I think that no, we should take everybody. But that's been a lot of arguments about that so far. So um, I want to, you know what, I'm going to skip over this because there's some data here that I want to show you. Is my time up? Five minutes. Excellent. So there was a serendipitous finding that came along with this study that we did not know about, and it was very surprising to me. And that was the effect of BDNF genotype on aphasia severity in people with chronic aphasia. Um, what we found was that at baseline, the folks with typical BDNF genotype actually had milder aphasia than the folks with atypical BDNF genotype. And we just did on the Western aphasia battery, on the four main scores on the Western aphasia battery, we did a, an ANOVA, and we found the main effect for genotype. So that folks in the blue group, this is the typical BDNF genotype group, they actually tend to have quite a bit milder aphasia than those who have the atypical BDNF genotype. Suggesting that there's a genetic basis for long-term recovery from aphasia. We also looked at our other outcome tests, um, the pyramids and palm trees test. There was actually no difference with regards to semantic processing. There was no difference on the ways, but there was a difference on the Boston naming test, the Philadelphia naming test, and, but there was no difference in education 
the folks in the atypical BDNF genotype group tend to do have greater depression. Uh, and that's not surprising because they have more severe aphasia. Um, there was another surprising finding here that might just be a complete fluke, and that uh, there was a difference with regards to diabetes, and not in the direction that you would think. The folks with typical BDNF genotype actually were far more likely to have diabetes. And I emphasize to this to my students that we call this gene a BDNF gene. But that doesn't mean that the only thing that this gene is doing is influencing brain plasticity. It does many other things, including has been implicated in cardiovascular disease and with regards to renal function. So this obviously would have to be replicated in a much larger trial to be shown if that is true or not. It might just be a fluke. There was no difference in exercise, lesion size, age, or overall stroke severity. So, um, there was one study that has looked actually at BDNF genotype with regards to early recovery from aphasia. And my colleague Mika van de Sant in the Netherlands, uh, it was a group that included her. This was published in the Journal of Neurorehabilitation and Neuro Repair last year. And they found no differences in aphasia severity in acute patients or early aphasia treatment success. But the current data suggests that BDNF genotype is associated with aphasia severity. So why the discrepancy? Um, it might be the effects are too subtle to be detected in acute patients. If really BDNF genotype influences brain plasticity that is important for recovery from aphasia, I suspect that that, that will have to take uh, place over a long period of time. So perhaps Deborah et al. were simply looking at aphasia too early. Uh, the average time post-stroke in the current study was three and a half years, so that's a very long time. One minute, I'm almost done. Um, when we look at BDNF, uh, the difference in activity-dependent BDNF secretion between folks with typical and atypical BDNF genotype, the difference is only 18 to 30 percent. So it's not like the folks with atypical BDNF genotype don't secrete BDNF. That wouldn't make any sense. They, they wouldn't function. But there is this difference that is there, and I, if these data can be taken at face value, obviously they need to be replicated. It could be the case that this only matters for really long-term outcome. So, let's see. There's some, I don't know what's going on with the laptop. Can you come take a look at it real quick? There's a blue screen, I don't know. Can I get back 30 seconds? <laughs> so in closing, um, so TBCS modulates brain activity. The mechanisms are not clear. That was that one slide that I skipped. I wanted to talk a little bit about the mechanism. Uh, we still don't know that much about them. If, so I would say that in this time, TBCS may improve aphasia treatment outcome. We need to know more about for whom, when, what's the proper dosage, and what's the proper uh, format. Um, the baseline factors may help speech language pathologists predict whether an individual is likely to respond to treatment, certainly with regards to the genotype. A um, couple of housekeeping things. This is, this is just a funder, the National Institutes of Health. Uh, our team, which did almost all the work, I was really just watching most of the time, uh, both at the University of South Carolina and the Medical University of South Carolina. These people did a fabulous job. And if you're not familiar with our C-STAR lectures, the Center for the Study of Aphasia Recovery, these are lectures that you can see in live. We do this every other Thursday at 2 o'clock on the East Coast of the United States. You can log on and you can see lectures, some very interesting lectures from some of the leaders in our field, including Kathy Price, who's here with us today. We've also had lectures from people like Greg Hickok, R.J. Hollis, uh, some of the, what, what I would consider the leaders in our field. If you're interested in getting on the listserv and knowing what the lectures are going to be for the upcoming week, you can email Dirk Denau, who is my colleague who runs the C-STAR lectures for us. If you can't see the, the lectures live, we used to usually have the lectures up on our YouTube channel within about two or three days after the lecture itself. So you can go now. I hear a lot from professors that they use this as part of their uh, um, lectures for their students. 
So we've been doing this for about two and a half years, so a lot of lectures included there already. And finally, if you would, I would really like to uh, ask for your help with a survey that we have ongoing. We are trying to figure out, for speech language pathologists, if we have a positive trial for TVCS as an adjunct, adjuvant to aphasia therapy, how much of an improvement, percentage-wise, would you have to see as a speech language pathologist for you to think this is worthwhile to incorporate into my clinical practice? So if you go to that URL right there, this is uh, is.gd slash aphasia underscore survey, and fill out the survey, it'll take you probably less than five minutes. I would really appreciate it. So I'll stop at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julius, for a fantastic talk. Uh, we have time for a question or two, and I think we have a roving mic. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, do you have a question? Sit down.